A very good afternoon to everyone joining us today. I'm Rachayata and I welcome you all to another episode of LinkedIn Live with Logistics Insider. Our theme for today's discussion is regulatory compliance for exporters in the Gulf region with a focus on Saudi Arabia. And this session is powered by HQTS. Now, during the last decade or so, the Gulf region has transformed from being just a desert to an oasis of opportunities for the world. It has been growing as an increasingly attractive destination for exporters looking to expand their markets. To take the complete leverage of the Gulf market, there is a growing need to navigate complex and ever-changing regulatory uh, frameworks and exporters to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf region must comply with various regulations and requirements to conduct business in a legal and compliant manner. Now, these uh, regulations, uh, these, uh, these in, uh, you know, the, the norms, they include customs regulations, uh, export controls, anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing regulations, product safety, quality standards, and taxation re uh, regulations. Now, while there are numerous agencies that help exporters through the entire process of shipping their goods to countries around the world, each country has its own uh, set of regulatory compliance norms to be followed. It is therefore advisable to seek guidance from legal or regulatory export, uh, sorry, expert um, to ensure that you are complying with all the relevant uh, regulations and requirements. This panel today will bring together experts from various facets to discuss and deliberate uh, the challenges and opportunities of regulatory compliance for exporters in the Gulf region. We hope to shed light on key issues and provide valuable insights for exporters looking to enter this dynamic and promising market. Now that we are on the same page about what uh, today's session will entail, let me introduce you to our panel members. First up, we have our session moderator and an expert in EXIM, Dr. Pramod Sant. He is the former vice president, head oh. of Import, Export and Customs, Siemens Limited. An extremely warm personality, Dr. Sant has devoted the majority of his career uh, looking after EXIM operations for various uh, companies in India. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Ms. Poonam Rawat, Sales Manager, Government Trade Services, HQTS Group. A young and dynamic woman, Ms. Rawat has joined the HQTS Group recently. However, she brings to the table more than eight years of service in the government trade service business. Welcome to the show, ma'am. Thank you. Now to join us next, we have Mr. Khalid Khan, Vice President FIEO and Director Gecko Group of Companies. Under his able leadership and taking leverage of his vast experience, the Gecko Group has expanded its activities by diversifying its export portfolio. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Coming up next is Dr. Anil Chinabhandar, Senior Vice President, Supply Chain, Landmark Group. Dr. Chinabhandar is a celebrated veteran of the supply chain sector, and through his years of service to many renowned brands, he has developed expertise in various subject matters pertaining to the supply chain. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Rajendra. And now the last member of our panel, Mr. Edwin Jesudas, General Manager, Head of Import, uh, Export and Customs, Siemens uh, India. Uh, Mr. Jesudas has been behind some of the most groundbreaking initiatives in lending visibility into logistics movement. His rich experience in leading change management, helping organizations adapt to new age technology and includes uh, the fast changing VUCA world. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you so much. 
Now, I welcome you all once again to this LinkedIn Live session, and it is a pleasure to be amid industry experts like yourselves. Now, with this, I'm going to hand over the reins to, of the show to our moderator. And before I do that, I'd like to uh, tell our audience that the speakers will be taking your questions towards the end of the show. So please post your questions in the comments box below, and we will try our best to answer each of them. Over to you, Dr. Sand. Thank you. Thank you, Racheta. So firstly, I wanted to thank the Logistic Insider, Gaurav, Racheta, Apurva and team for selecting these subjects. Very important subject. Today, India is in best place to really increase its exports. A lot of initiatives has been taken. India has never fell short of the entrepreneurs who are ready to export everything. But we see that the government is really taking a lot of steps to encourage this exports few steps which are making in india scheme which is encouraging people to make the things in india for global uh, pm gati shakti which will add a lot of really infrastructure for the uh, exporters pli scheme i think this is one of the really good scheme which is really taking the shape where the people will manufacture in india for the global business export promotion scheme liberalized fdi norms and national logistics policy. These are the few things which is helping exporter and exports is having focus which was never before in. We are lucky to have this time. Export promotion schemes also, we are eagerly waiting for a new foreign trade policy in coming month. But before that, there are still schemes which are going on. The interest equalization scheme, trade infrastructure for export scheme, market access uh, initiative, ROCTL, our road tape, as well as the common digital platform for the certificate of origin, the champion service sector, and the uh, district as export hub. So all this is really fast, uh, helping the exporters, encouraging exporters to do increase the exports. Now, if you look at in today's world, India's share into global market is just coming to around 2% or 2.1% for which the target is to reach the 3% by 2027 and 10% by 2047. But increasing this exports, today's our rank is 18th, from there to increase, the focus on Gulf sector is very important. The GCC uh, sector, which has got the countries UAE, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Oman, Qatar, and uh, the Kuwait have a lot of importance because India's second highest export after USA is coming to UAE, then at the number ninth, which is the Saudi Arabia. So in top 15 countries, you have two important countries which are in Middle East, which is the UAE and Saudi Arabia. At the same time, you can see the lot of increase in exports, uh, particularly uh, with uh, UAE and Bahrain and Oman. Uh, I have seen uh, the, the recent has come out that the exports to these countries has increased drastically. A lot of export increases comes to around close to increase in 44%. At some countries, it is really helping uh, to increase the Indian share into these countries. One more thing which need to be mentioned is the free trade agreement, SEPA agreement between India and UAE. India has not done a free trade agreement in the last couple of years because there was always a debate whether the free trade agreement is suitable it is helping India or it is really not helpful for the Indian industry. But after a lot of deliberation, this SEPA free trade agreement has been done with UAE, which covers the 90% of the traded bilateral items and could make the Indian exporter competitive by around 45 to 5% duty will get waived off. The recent data after uh, FTA has come in force, it shows the good high volume of uh, exports under the FTA agreement and increase in free trade agreements. So with this all good background, we will feel that, yes, there are opportunities to do exports into a, a Middle East and a Gulf region. And at the same time, there are some challenges which needs to be addressed. So we will go into two stages. For, in first stage, we will talk about the Gulf region in uh, in overall, and then we will focus on Saudi Arabia. 
so khalid uh, sir you are a vice president in fio and when i look at fio you have a membership of 30000 exporters with you and i can imagine this 30000 exporter which includes not only big country big companies but also the small scale and medium scale which is a backbone for exports and i am quite sure uh, being a vice president looking after uh, interest of this uh, exporters can you give us what exporters feel about these opportunities in gulf and what challenges they face over to you khalid ji thank you pramod uh, thank you for giving this platform to me today to be here and to be to share my views on exports to gcc countries and especially to saudi arabia well you have uh, covered most of the points pramod during your introductory speech that what has been the advantage for indians to export to gulf countries i mean you talked about the pli scheme you talked about the free trade agreement you talked about the uh, the free trade agreement uh, pli scheme and the government incentive schemes and all you are right the current off late the and uae being the number 2 destination for indian exports absolutely right this is the fact and i won't deny that at all okay the fact is that india's export to the gulf country is growing good because these countries are not affected by the total what is happening in the world market the geopolitical situation where europe and america is very badly hurt and the demand has come down normally literally the exports from india to those countries i mean the importers have st are uh, stopping the imp for that end and that's a challenge in exports as well and which is reflected which probably you must have reflected in last two months export india's exports have fallen in last two months the merchandise export i'm talking not about the services okay gulf is a very closest destination to indian export i mean dubai is like for indian exporter a way for both business and pleasure if you say they go out for pleasure but they do business and come back so that's the ease with dubai actually and similarly oman i mean all these countries have opened up very good their regulation is also very conducive i mean there is no two strict regulatory bodies there in these countries qatar oman bahrain uh, kuwait dubai uae for that matter so exports from india to these countries are very easy as well the connectivity is very close i mean flying is easier the transit by voyage is also four days to dubai which is absolutely very small so all these factors are in, and the indian diaspora the indian diaspora at all these countries i mean we have a good diaspora there i mean our people are working there our people are serving at the top level in top notch companies so all this definitely is helping the indian export you're talking of fta this fta was signed in 80 days i mean we had never done an fta in 80 to 90 days with any country in this world i mean it's fortunate that we have a good fta between uae and india i mean it's it's really helpful to the uae counterpart and indian counterpart imports are not that that much happening though but exports have benefited because 90% of products are in 0% duty the rest are 0.4.5 and over phase of 10 years probably it will be totally zero so this fta which has come into effect i mean has facilitated the export more to uae and uae is also a destination to go to africa cis yeah. countries ha huh? that's a big destination because uae's consumption on its own is very less oman has its own consumption because that's a bigger country on size as well okay like saudi arabia but uae is a biggest destination for re exports i mean a lot of free zones available which the other countries are replicating qatar is replicating bahrain is replicating and uh, even kuwait is replicating that okay so most of the countries are but people in india is like dubai jane ka ha why because that's that's become a trend actually okay aap kisi ko aap you will not listen any saying anybody is qatar jana hai ha huh? qatar was the destination for football okay lot of business has indians really benefited in that football whatever happened in qatar because lot of technical expertise had gone there lot of retail activities have been done there so all this has really helped indian exporters 
to look into these Gulf countries and do more business. And the best part is there is regulation is there, but to a certain extent, it is very easily compatible to Indian exporters to meet with. So these countries have been successful and we have been successful in doing business with. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Khalid. I mean, really, these are encouraging uh, remarks and I'm quite sure the exporters uh, will really feel, yes, uh, this is a destination. And it's a good destination, no doubt about it. You are able to, sometime in India, you will take more time to travel, but you can go to Dubai and do the business much faster. People can have a business meeting in Dubai instead of flying sometime to Calcutta or somewhere. So it's true. Dr. Anil, you represent a retail part of it. So Khalid has uh, definitely merchandise exports. He covers everything. But I wanted to focus a little more on to the retail. So what is the situation in retail? And also Khalid mentioned that, yes, uh, from UAE, you can focus on Africa um, and uh, West Asia and other countries. So what do you think about it uh, from the retail point of view? Uh, well, uh, you know, thank you for the opportunity, first of all. And then I would like to congratulate, uh, you know, uh, logistics inside a team for you know again you know, launching this uh, conference and also kind of giving an opportunity to uh, bridge the gap between uh, you know the the professionals and also the aspiring probably exporters and so on. Um, uh, Dr. Sant, actually, I would completely you know agree with uh, Mr. Khalid and then kind of you know even go on to kind of confirm most of the things what he said, particularly in the retail space. I think it's one of the easier territories, easier kind of, you know, uh, regions to do uh, business with. And then as he said, pretty much there is, uh, you know, there is very little resistance or there is very little kind of a, uh, you know, uh, a closed door or, a, you know, brick wall or something like, you know, most of the things are very open in nature. And then we are, we are able to, you know, easily kind of do the business, be it apparels or actually, the, you know, the general merchandise or in fact sporting goods or even the you know some bits of uh, electronics and computer peripherals even though it's not a big deal but then by and large the retail opportunity or even the hospitality sector and all that is pretty much actually you know uh, comparable to the uh, comparable to the ones you know which is in in india also so as far as the opportunity goes it's pretty much there and also who are the audience again? You know, once again, the migrant community you know, is probably one of the biggest target customers for us, you know, in the retail. Therefore, there's already a familiarity for you. I mean, uh, we pretty much talk about, you know, India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and all those things actually, you know, in this, you know, in our country here, right? Whereas when you are in Dubai or when you are actually in that part of the world, you're almost like, you know, the same family. Like, you know, Pakistan is your neighbor and then Sri Lanka is another neighbor and then uh, Bangladesh is actually are just, you know, down the same floor, actually, say, say things like that, right? So this is a two kind of a, a, a mini global kind of a economy or a mini global cultural setup, you know, if I can put it that way. So in terms of target customers, you pretty much know who your target customers are. And then there is already a fascination of probably uh, towards India or the Indian culture or the cultural kind of, you know, the the merchandise and so on, you know, even from the Westerners actually. So Dubai is always, al almost the gateway to even to the West in some sense, right? So therefore, that familiarity also kind of, you know, opens the door for us as a retailer. So whether it's our apparel or general merchandise or, you know, the hometown business with the furniture and so on, I think it's a, it's a pretty conducive environment for any retailers or aspiring retailers to kind of do business with. Having said that, we are a very large retail format. We've also seen smallish kind of even retailers are also doing business with ease. I don't think there is any, you know, great deal of kind of, uh, even though there are strict actually quality control, uh, you know, issues and checks and balances actually on variety of goods and so on. I don't think it is anything, you know, which is uh, impossible or, you know, it's, you know, difficult to kind of deal with. So most of the environment is very conducive for, uh, you know, Indian exporters and, with a little bit of a helping hand from the you know agencies or from the consultants or some of the you know uh, the the you know uh, the team such as Mr. Khalid has been using, I guess it's it's a very friend you know business friendly and kind of you know like customer friendly kind of you know market as well as administration. So I I've not heard any really bad stories in terms of you know it's now it is you know unbelievable you know it's impossible to deal with none of those things actually. Yeah, thoda bahut mushkil rehta hai, kabhi -kabhi. But then, 
by and large i think it's a great opportunity and the ftas and the things whatever you said about the incentive side of things and so on right that should be uh, that should be an enough motivator for probably every aspiring exporter in fact to kind of you know go and uh, you know start doing business or even expand the business actually into the region so we'll anyway discuss some of the specifics in fact little later in the session but then i think by and large i think it's a very very you know a good place to kind of you know expand your business that's what i would like to say thank you thank you dr anil so i come to uh, you edwin edwin you handle exports for the one of the big multinational and it is a technology sector and uh, lot many things which are involved into te such technology product so what is your experience about the middle east when it comes to the exports uh, and uh, what challenges i mean we mentioned that yes the crowd is familiar there but in engineering it may not be so uh, and how they treat as a multinational uh, you have the german parent company who is also having goods you are also from india having the goods so what is your opinion how is the market uh, for a high tech industry and uh, uh, companies like you thank you so much dr pramod sant and thank you uh, logistics insider team for the opportunity provided so firstly talk talk about the gcc countries uh, i mean uh, i think the market is fairly evenly balanced and they are quite forward looking uh, india uh, is probably one of the largest exporters to these countries especially if you talk about uae or you talk about uh, uh, countries like uh, saudi arabia okay they are high qatar they are high consumers of uh, products like ours and especially when you talk about an engineering infrastructure development company a there is a uh, there is a special focus on infrastructure development in most of these countries and uh, with so much of uh, oil refineries there we have a sizable amount of investment in, in both services exports as well as goods export to these countries because a they focus on electrification transmission and distribution and so on and so forth as well as in automation of the industrial plants and machineries as far as our experience with these gcc countries goes i think the experience has been fairly equal uh, normal uh, no untoward uh, incidents of uh, any harsh behaviors okay the markets are very open as it is in india yes they are definitely forward looking they are changing for good Uh, there are a lot of automation happening in most of these assessments and customs dealings there is a lot of transparency being brought about uh, in the form of information readily being available on on their customs portal the portals becoming high so i think uh, uh, more or less the customs uh, regulations in most of these countries has been good and the experience so far for specifically for goods under 84 85 chapter have been good and of course yes also to say is that there are no second uh, level treatments stating that okay this is an export coming from india okay indian goods are treated at par with uh, the uh, the products that probably get manufactured from the european european uh, principles too so therefore i feel that there is a respect to yeah great business reason yeah uh, thank you uh, thank you edwin so one important point which came that uh, if goods are coming from european or other countries and the indian good engineering goods are treated equally it is not a differentiation that if products are coming from india Uh, they need uh, or they are a little less in quality i think this is a really good input that they treat european goods and uh, indian goods equally i think this is very important now i will come to saudi arabia see we have been seeing saudi arabia and recent all the articles shows there non oil consumption uh, so is or development into non oil sector is increasing drastically number one they have seen the the purchasing things which are non oil has increased or the, to the highest level from 2015 onwards in this years they are spending uh, they are really focusing on the purchasing their purchasing power is good they are focusing on to really good development so saudi arabia is at definitely today number 9 in india's total list and second in gulf but they have a capability to grow further they have a appetite and they have money so saudi arabia is a good opportunity so punam i come to you now with this background saudi arabia and your company what is ex- your opinion and what you exactly do to support the exporter you have seen the enthusiasm of exporters 
Khalid is representing 30,000 exporters. You are seeing multinational, you are seeing the, uh, the retail business, all are enthusiastic and they find that it is opportunity as Khalid mentioned that they have money, it is not affected. So everybody is looking at it. So can you brief uh, what, uh, how you can help uh, from your organization, this exporter and what you exactly do? Yes. Yeah, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pramod. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pramod. Yes, uh, I'm from HQTS India, Government Trade Services Department, and we here handle all the certification related to the different, different sectors, different countries. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce HQTS. HQTS is a leading con quality control company in Asia with global presence in over 20 countries and offices in all major trade and production regions such as India, Vietnam, China, Uganda, UAE and among others. We operate in the testing, inspection and certification industry and are a full member of the TIC concept. Uh, with over a decade of experience, we have helped over 50,000 clients worldwide through our quality assurance services. Uh, we have had, uh, our operation in India started back in 2008 and we have since expanded to provide quality assurance services throughout the entire Pan-India region. As we are here to discuss about the importance of the regulatory compliance to export in Saudi Arabia market. So Saudi Arabia is a rapidly growing market and one of the largest in the Middle East. However, for the companies looking to export their products to Saudi Arabia, it's essential to be aware of the country's product safety program. Uh, business exporting or importing regulated products to the um, KSA, like Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, need to demonstrate compliance and meet applicable technical regulation and standards. Uh, it's important to note that the regulation requirement in Saudi Arabia may change time to time. And it's always best to check with the Saudi Arabian uh, authorities and trade organization for the most updates. That's where we as a third party comes in. We help exporters and logistic companies with the testing and inspection services in their respective regions to ensure that their products meet all the relevant national standards. And then we issue certificates of conformity for consignments that comply with the regulation to ensure smooth process at the borders. Here are some general steps uh, that exporters need to take in order to export to Saudi Arabia. Like first, uh, research the market. Uh, definitely uh, uh, understanding the demand of your product and the competition and the regulation and standards in the Saudi Arabia. That is very much important. What are your the um, uh, product and what is the you know uh, standard regulation provided by the Saudi Arabia market? Then uh, definitely identify the potential buyers and establish to business relationship with them. And after that, which comes to the comply with the custom regulation, uh, exporter has to ensure that you comply with the, all the custom regulations and procedures in Saudi Arabia, including obtaining the national uh, license and uh, completing the required paperwork, uh, which is very important in the Saudi market. And after that, uh, to arrange the transportation of your goods to Saudi Arabia and handle all the necessary logistics, such as arranging the freight forwarding, warehousing, insurance. And after that, you can take follow with your buyer to ensure that everything goes smoothly with the import and delivery of goods. And it is very advisable that to have a local representative in Saudi Arabia to facilitate communication and com compliance with the regulations and customs of the country. And make sure you have all the necessary documents before all the uh, these exports and logistics and transportation that you need uh, require commercial invoice, bill of lading, and certificate of origin and other documents which required for the shipments. Yes, there is one more thing which need to be focused at uh, the local culture. We have to keep in mind that Saudi Arabia has a unique culture and customs and uh, make sure we are aware of that and uh, respect these when conducting business in the country. So uh, here I'm telling you about the something about the certification for the different different product like uh, certain goods entering the Saudi market must be verified through the nation's product conformity assessment program. These products uh, referred as to as a regulated product must meet a series of technical regulations set by the Saudi standards meteorological and quality organization that is SASO. Every regulated product imported to the country must be accompanied by a product certification of conformity, that is PCOC program issued by a certification body and shipment COC for every shipment. 
Uh, sorry to say, but uh, failure to comply with these regulations can result in delay, penalties, or the shipment being returned. Uh, the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia requires a uh, PCOC, that is product uh, conformity of the certification of conformity and shipment COC for the certain regulated items that includes electronics items, chemical, textile, construction building materials, mechanical items. Uh, to obtain these uh, certificates, there is a platform which is called Sabir. Uh, this platform aims to protect the businesses from fraud and ensure that the products are free from defects and may affect the health and safety of the cons uh, consumers. There is another program which is GMAR certificate. That GMAR certificate uh, demonstrate compliance with the Gulf technical regulations when exporting products to the Gulf states. The conformity marking, marking is compulsory for low voltage electrical equipments and the children's toy. The Kingdom of Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia requires a conformity mark for multiple product categories, which includes electric items, air conditioner, refrigerators, plug sockets, washing machines, water he uh, heater, microwave oven, hair dryer, and electric irons, and many other home appliances like this. There is another uh, certification, which is SQM certificate. That is the Saudi quality mark certificate. Uh, it is a conformity mark granted by the Saudi standards metallurgical and quality organization. This mark is issued to factories that have an efficient management system and continually adhere to applicable technical regulation in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It is proof that the facilities has an effective quality control and the assurance system to produce goods with the required quality meet the standards. There are some, uh, you know, product which require SQM certificate. Those are uh, ready mix uh, concrete and cement, ceramic and porcelain tiles, steel bars, uh, iron plates, gas appliance and accessories, aluminum composite panel, electric, uh, electrical extension cords, plugs, switches and sockets. Uh, the last one that is uh, SFDA program. That Kingdom of Saudi Arabia requires that all the consignment of cosmetics and food products exported to the country comply with the Saudi Food and Drug Authority technical regulation, that is SFDA. Uh, that SFDA COC serves as a proof for the conformity of your food and cosmetic products with the Saudi Arabian regulation and is to be presented to the customer authorities upon import to ensure that your delivery arrives safely and on time at its destination. It's important to note that exporting to Saudi Arabia can be complex and time consuming, but with the right preparation, research and compliance with the regulation, it can be a profitable market for your business. It always uh, best to consult with a trade expert or authorities uh, bodies who is familiar with the Saudi Arabian market to help you nav navigate the process. With that, uh, I would like to thank you all for att attending today's webinar. And I hope the information I provided about Saudi Arabia's conformity program was helpful. And I would just like to point out that as a third party quality control company, we have witnessed many cases where non-compliant goods were penalized, re-exported or destroyed and resulting in additional cost for the exporter. Therefore, as a closing mark, I would like to suggest all exporters to understand the national standards and technical yeah. regulations applicable to their product category yeah. uh, before yeah. exporting to a particular country. In yeah. case of any certainties, it is always to seek the advice from the relevant authorities like us, HQTs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Poonam. Thank you. So uh, my impression comes is that uh, there are quite a number of non-tariff barriers which could be happening into when you are exporting to Saudi Arabia. I could see the replica of FASAI or BIS or other things, which is exactly in Saudi Arabia, similar way. So, Khalid, uh, I mean, any non tariff barrier is always to protect the local industry or to protect their consumers, also, we can say. And it adds a cost, transaction cost delay. Huna mentioned about delay and uh, the cost and risk also. So how you feel the exporters are able to grab this opportunity, they are facing these challenges or these are manageable. This is my question to Khalid and then I will come back on uh, more with to Anil and Edwin. Yeah, so uh, over to you Khalid. Thank you Pramod. Uh, Poonam, thank you for a presentation that you did 
but unfortunately your presentation only said what we have to do okay how to do and the cost and the damages for that you didn't mention that so fine i understand that not a problem though but taking talking of saudi arabia we, i just spoke few minutes before i i applauded the gcc countries i said very good access and everything and everything is fine saudi arabia is a part of gcc country also but you can see with what poonam said the challenges that an exporter has to face to export to saudi arabia whereas this challenges doesn't come when you export to the other five countries of gcc well it is their way of working it is their system it is their government we are looking at his excellency mohammed bin salman doing a lot of improvements in what was earlier a conservative country to a modern country and a lot of changes are happening having said that all this saso and sabr you know that certification it is only adding cost to an exporter's product and making money for the certification bodies indirectly i mean I'm, what i want to say is the customer the exporter has to bear this cost it is a profit to the i mean the bodies who are certifying it which the other countries like dubai or uae or oman or kuwait and all they don't read this okay just for an example i mean i have made some few i have taken some research on this before i came here let me tell you about a specific industry which is a tile industry who has to export to saudi arabia you know an expense of 17 lakh rupees 17 lakh rupees for 3 years they have to incur first year the expenses for registering in sarbic and saso is 12 lakh rupees 7.5 goes to our tuv or hqts or whatever it is okay for their services and 3 lakh goes to the saso admin balance i mean 7 and 1/2 lakh sorry the balance goes to the saso admin so both are making money there end of the day that is for 3 years second year you have to pay 2 and 1/2 lakh rupees third year also you have to pay 2 and 1/2 lakh rupees and entire process is takes 3 to 2 to 3 months to get this registered in spite of that the import duty is 106% in that country for the tile and that is for the new factories i mean there is there are the factories which have been in existence before 2016 for them there is a 42% anti dumping they don't come under 106% see there is a different duty structure as well in spite of doing all this and everybody has to go through sabik and sabir what do you say saso and sabir so there are no new companies getting registered in this so we are losing business they are protecting their own industry okay this is just one example i took there's one more example which i have here this is come from a company in ludhiana they say after implementation of saso we are facing a huge challenge to process small orders to saudi arabia region problem is testing certificates older than 4 years are rejected by saso even though the product is not changed physically now you understand saso rejects the certificate the product has not changed but saso says go back get me more certificate get me a certification the cost of testing of some small products is quite high and it demand and if demands are customized by saudi buyer then it is an extra burden to get testing done again since other regions like eu accepts older test reports thus a self certification should be accepted by saso that is the view the saso charges are exorbitant he says the saso charges are quite steep of around 800 to 1000 dollars per product the cost of this charges should either be reduced or an additional subsidy by indian or saudi government I mean, that is his way of saying and all these are creating problem and challenges for exports to saudi arabia saudi arabia though it comes under number 9 position for india's export but they have different rules and regulation for different products i mean that is something which is very difficult and the charges as i told you exporters need to find out a way how to get them i mean i have got one thing one more dr sai has sent me government controlled enterprise in saudi arabia are increasingly introducing local content requirements for foreign firms aramco's in kingdom total value added iktva program for example strongly encourages the purchase of goods and services from local supplier base and aims to double aramco's percentage of locally manufactured energy related goods and services to 70% by 2021 this is what is happening in saudi arabia 
I mean, I was talking to an exporter who was ex exporting from here PVC raisins or something like that. He said earlier I was supplying directly to Aramco. But now they said they have to be supplied through a mediator. The mediator makes money. This guy is, is not making money because there is a third party which has come involved. So these challenges are really very high. And it is becoming, I mean, it is becoming really challengeable as we the days are going by. So my thing, my way of looking at it is that why can't Saudi Arabia follow what the other G countries are following? Number one, okay. G GCC has six countries, whatever they are. The duty, import duty is the same in because they have formed a group so that the import duty is common in all the countries. So why can't they have a solution that if UAE is accepting it, why not we accept it? Secondly, I mean, what uh, Poonam said that they were trying to control uh, money laundering or something. I mean, certification doesn't control money laundering. Okay. Certification is basically called SQM. SQM is a the most difficult problematic thing because what I understand, I'm, I may be wrong. Poonam, correct me if I am wrong. The guys come from Saudi Arabia, they fly to it, the destination and then they, they verify the factories. And they verify the structure. I mean, they don't give it to SGS or maybe SQDS to go and do a verification. And do they come here and the expenses about, I was looking out for export steel. The expenses were 70 lakh rupees to register it. I gave up the business because I can't afford it. Okay. Understood. Honestly speaking, I can't afford it. So these challenges are becoming big. They can have us like how Europe has CE marking. It is very common for everybody to get a CE compliant thing. Siemens, as Siemens, you must be also, Edwin must be also getting a C compliance for export to Europe and all things. So it could be worked out. I mean, this is my suggestion to yeah. the uh, people who are hearing me out today and to the authorities present today that, that they can come out with one certification body, one C mark or something like that, which can help people to export to any destination in the GCC countries. So all these things, if we put together, export to Saudi Arabia is becoming challenged. They have their own industry to protect. I do understand that. But having said that, for food, I mean, I heard now that commodity is also becoming a big problem. There is a approval for like, I think she said SFDA, something like that for commodities. I mean, you are exporting rice also has to pass. So we are doing FASA here. We are doing phytosanitary here. We have everything here, which we do, which is also a requirement. So apart from doing all those things, I mean, this is getting more challengeable. I mean, I am not against anything, but I am trying to make the system. I'm trying to understand the system and I'm trying to suggest a system that can ease the business for everybody to Saudi Arabia. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think you have really very clearly told problems uh, uh, which are there. And yes, the genuine expectations are yes, it needs to be reasonable. You have to understand the requirement of each country, but it needs to be this thing and this difference in GS, uh, GCC countries and Saudi Arabia is a glaring difference. It is in you have what and uh, Khalid mentioned the products which will have C marking already. And uh, do they respect uh, the you are products are approved in Germany or in USA and in India? Do they respect or you need to also go through these testings? Uh, what is a global certification? Is it helping in Saudi Arabia or we have to go for uh, approvals? Uh, is there any uh, guidelines or is there anything helps on that? Sir, so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, the answer is yes, as well as a no, okay? Uh, because the fact that the Saber and the quality requirements is quite standard across for any and every goods that gets, reg that's a regulated product and enters into Saudi Arabia. So you will naturally have to kind of comply through that, okay? But yes, the authorities have a little lenient stand when they when they know that yes, your product is uh, compliant under the European standards, okay? But yes, procedurally, you will have to kind of register the product under the product certification. And then of course, every time you have a shipment coming in, you will also have to kind of go for a shipment certification. And, and of course, the product certification is kind of uh, gives you a validity almost for one year. So you could uh, ship n number of shipments under that for that period as uh, you know, as long as it lasts. But of course, every year this has this is a continuous process and you will have to go through that procedure. So it is same for uh, MSME and it is same for multinational also. It is same for all Indian companies. Absolutely. Probably. I yes. understand. Anil, uh, what is the scenario Absolutely, in retail? Yes, but... I, oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I, I didn't. 
So at the same yeah, time, yeah. having said so, sir, apart from, yeah, having said so, if the certification is once done, uh, thereafter, the clearances are not that uh, cumbersome. I mean, you know, it's, it's as easy as, you know, you clear a goods in India and then, uh, you know, you get a pre-alert a couple of days earlier and then you are able to get, you know, get the shipment certificates and within about uh, half a day or one day, the shipments are out from customs. So it is not that cumbersome thereafter. Thereafter. Okay. That's a good point. That is a little silver lining. Yeah, on the difficult situation. Anil, uh, now she mentioned about so many items which come in retail market. So many items which come in retail market. So how are you tackling uh, this thing or how is your focus with such a requirement uh, and uh, the agencies which you require approvals, etc. What is your experience and what to be done uh, so that this is little better off uh, for uh, exporters? Well, uh, Pramoji, in fact, um... I think uh, most of the things, whatever Poonamji was mentioning was um, or is actually for some of the newcomers or the, you know, uh, the upgradation of actually the businesses and things like that, right? Uh, you know, incidentally, I, I, I've refrained myself from saying fortunately, because we've been there in the GCC countries for the last 45 years, which means, you know, we are almost part of the, uh, you know, overall culture, be it KSA or rest of the, you know, GCC countries and so on. So we have kind of grown with the system. Therefore, um, I mean, uh, Kaliji mentioned uh, quite a few challenges and all that because he covers a vast, you know, uh, amount or a vast range of actually industries and so on. Fortunately, retail, uh, retail formats actually have a lot more, um, you know, a kind of a proven, a demonstrated or even kind of, a, you know, uh, easy to kind of, you know, go through situations in, in terms of certification. There are not so many barricades as such because um, maybe that is yet to come. I mean, looking at the science of it, uh, now that, you know, they are looking at encouraging a lot of local uh, manufacturers, local agencies and so on. Maybe the retail is, you know, not too far away from, you know, certain restrictions and so on. But then again, I don't know, maybe, you know, uh, I'm trying to take a probably slightly a philosophical probably approach. I mean, um, be a Roman when you are in Rome. I mean, you know, what are we talking about? I mean, India was one of the most controlled economies until very recently, right? So we actually have been through the mill. We actually have been through the uh, the barriers and all the, all the, the whatever the... Uh, uh, you know, the Sarkar Raj or whatever they used to call, right? I mean, like the the controlled economies and all that. I mean, uh, when we were kids, actually, we were looking at people coming from Middle East, actually, to even get our bath soaps and all that. Kami soap was one of the most favorite gifts, actually, that we would expect from people coming back from Dubai and then, you know, Saudi and all that. So it's actually an evolution, right? So I think we are in that part of it. So in terms of retail, I don't, I don't see, you know, so much of struggle or so much of kind of a unanswered situations and so on. Having said that, particularly Saudi, you have certain rules, you have certain expectations, you have certain methodologies that the community or the culture or even the government works. You will have to just get on with it. For example, Ramadan happens to be one of the most challenging times for us, right? I mean, the the ports actually don't work that efficiently. People don't turn up, in fact. And a lot of, you know, the inspectors are checking officials and then some of the people who are supposed to kind of come and enable these transactions. All of a sudden, they go for probably a long leaves and things like that. So your productivity dives down big time, actually, during those days. We will have to prepare for that. We will have to just work around that. And then being Indians, I think, you know, we are masters of not only... Uh, I wouldn't want to say the word jugad because it is not a jugad. It's actually, you know, better planning, in fact. So we do, you know, a lot of those, you know, pre-plans, in fact. So maybe get the shipments a month advance, which means my inventory holding cost might go up. And then, you know, I might be, you know, trying to probably, you know, pay a little extra for the peak season and things like that. Because, um, you know, on one side, if you are really getting it from China, there are Chinese New Year related actually pressures are there because it's all a global scenario, right? So therefore, there are some transactional hurdles that we need to deal with, which is what, you know, I think we have a large enough team locally sitting in Dubai office, locally sitting in GCC countries and so on. Uh, as I was saying, you know, before even starting this conference, you know, like sometimes, you know, to, you know, decongest the probably the rules, decongest the ports and so on. 
we might take the shipments to the alternate ports and then try to kind of clear it then clear it there and then try to kind of you know make sure that the inventory is available for the retail business and so on so i wouldn't want to probably um uh, you know say that there are some big hurdles which is un uh, un probably avoidable or you know like uh, uh, unbreakable kind of a thing we definitely can work through some of those things and uh, you know get to what we want i mean i definitely don't uh, have uh, the bigger challenges what uh, mr kalid was actually mentioning so it's all doable for us thank you i can understand that the first comer yeah first uh, uh, i will come to you kalid just give me a second yeah so that what happened the first somebody is doing entry will have different barriers this will be challenges different cost the people who are having uh, yes. the established they will have different <clears throat> more idea about what could happen or what you hope so we are running definitely out of short uh, this thing time so punam any quick comment on to the certification how you can help uh, with all the see you can see that you have uh, different type of customers so there are small customers who are cost sensitive who need a faster result they want entry how you can support them there are established people who may need some different requirement so your quick comment on that so uh, on this how you can help them as a third party uh, uh, sessions uh, we can just uh, follow the guidelines and regulation of the saso government uh, the sfda program and saso and skm uh, we can just help in that that we can uh, you know guide the exporters that uh, what all the requirements actually needed from the saudi government but yeah. uh, we can't comment uh, anything on the any cost of compliance and all because we are following the guidelines from this understood we understood are following the very, yeah yeah very clear reply so kalid when i come to you i have also uh, two short question for you one is the fio now you have seen uh, there are people who are established in middle east there are people who are having global support or mnc how fio facilitate ease of doing business for gulf as an organization this is my one quick question and second is do you see in new foreign trade policy the government focus on gulf have you given some suggestion or what are your expectation this two quick question for you and i have no better person than you thank you pramod now let's let me i raised my finger for just one reason dr anil said that we are you know we are very efficient people and we like for the month of ramadan and all we take care of everything but that's a short term thing that's for one month that we can prepare ourselves we can for a short period we can do a lot of things we are capable but i'm talk i was what i was talking was a on a larger perspective you know that the challenges are for even the newcomers and even for the old timers like how you see a tile company yeah a tile company was 2016 before he's also paying 46% okay but a tile company is registered now is paying 106% i mean this this is a challenge a small msme cannot stand all these challenges as long sure. as if it is uh, and if it is it has to be either supported by the government here under any scheme or something else or this so so called certification bodies are making money out of it and i'm sorry with the good respect to you puna i'm not talking about you. generally i'm talking don't take it personally so i uh, they are making money and the government of saudi arabia is making money for that anyways that is one thing which i wanted to come and interview and say that so we need to do something about this some has, something has to be worked on this as long as uh, we are talking of a gcc fta also if you know uh, pramod we are talking of a gcc fta also so probably this could be got your question so your first question was about uh, what as pio what are we doing to the exporters who help them in so we do a lot of facilitation for uh, the exporters in terms of we are, i'll correct your numbers we are 40000 not 30000 members okay we are 40000 members pan india in pio okay? okay so so we have to we we do a hand holding for every exporter right from an artisan to the top company i mean whoever there in, in 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 who needs our support we do a lot of b2b's in middle east countries we do a lot of uh, exhibitions there we took we take trade delegation we just finished in sourcex show in dubai a couple of months back that was a sourcex show of indian products in dubai and uh, it was very well attended a lot of people went there they could the small exporters i'm talking about the biggest don't need hand holding they can do it themselves so the small exporters the uh, the uh, micro medium small and all those people we do a lot of sh- such exhibitions we facilitate and in case they need any 
help in getting the FTA certificate of origin, although we are not authorized as PO to issue the certificate, but we guide them, we tell them where to go, how to get the certificates, and that really helps the exporters to promote themselves in Middle East. Your second question was about new foreign trade policy. Yeah. Do you expect some focus on the Gulf exports? I don't think so. There is any. We are waiting that foreign trade policy comes through by April 1st and we are very positive that this time the policy will come out. You know, the vision of our minister, uh, Dr. Mr. Piyush Goel, is that we are looking at 770 billion of trade uh, exports, which includes services as well as the merchandise. So, when we that is about 12 percent growth this is a statement in today's paper as well okay so with that vision we are we we are looking forward for some ease of doing business in this policy we are looking at an e-commerce related policy this time because we all have forgotten e-commerce i don't know how is sabar and sabik sabar and saso are going to come in this e-com business because what is the control there it is two piece going five piece going six piece going one piece going so that becomes absolutely useless i mean if you look at e-com business happening and then Sabir and Sasso happening, something is really wrong somewhere. That's what I was to say. Okay. So we are looking at uh, e-com policy to come, this, this policy, which is our main focus, and we are looking into that. Thank you, Pramod. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Edwin, I have one question with SEPA regulation or FTA. Do you feel something, uh, Gulf, particularly when UAE FTA has come? Whether it has uh, smooth selling or you have some new regulation or challenges or contains Indian contents, etc. You face anything or it's really a well done FTA and well done mechanism happening on a SEPA certification. At least, to, or... uh, at least I will feel on the, on the, I mean, sir, with reference to UAE FTA and the FTAs that we've signed thereafter, I mean, to count with the Australian FTA also, I feel there is a new uh, way of looking at the FTAs, okay? A, the scope and span of these FTAs are quite larger, okay? Uh, multiple different business scenarios are also taken into consideration, you know, while designing these FTAs, unlike the older ones, which are very straight jacketed and treating an export as single transaction. So I, I feel uh, the UAE FTA has also set up a very right tone and tenor in which the government is looking forward to and uh, li looking at promoting exports, uh, not only focusing on giving duty benefits in the country. So um, I think so. we are eagerly awaiting, with especially with Saudi Arabia, as we discussed, the trade is quite huge. I mean, you know, 34 billion of imports and about 8 billion of exports. So the balance of trade is quite high. So in order to boost exports, I think it is time that we seriously look at the GCC FTA. And uh, as early as possible, if that's pushed, I think we can certainly look at a growing trade between these two play, um, geographies. So, Anil, I give you a last minute for last comment, very quick comment. Before we close, we have just two minutes left. So, any quick comment from your side? No, no, I completely agree with, you know, Edwin. I think, you know, uh, even in terms of the FTA side of things, I mean, I'm I'm actually half Australian, right? I mean, I see a lot more focus. I mean, there is a great deal actually for us to, you know, uh, gain from actually Australia because, as I said, I'm an Australian. So, I have a lot more to export to India than the other way around. Right. Whereas in GCC, like exactly Edwin was saying, the opportunity is very huge. And if we have to become a whatever trillion, uh, you know, kind of economy or whatever uh, in the near future, the opportunity is right in front of our hand. I think GCC FTA will probably be the biggest opportunity for in our lifetimes. Actually, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I am. It is really interesting decision. One hour is. I am quite sure it is very difficult, but uh, we have got good uh, insight from variety of exporters, MSME, SME, multinational, uh, retail, and Punam, uh, good insight. One thing is very happy. One is that you are available for help to the people. Uh, you, you have heard the people from really what are their pain points. So if people need a certification, I think you will definitely, you and your organization will definitely help them to see that there some of the pain is at least reduced. On this note, I wanted to really thank uh, Khalid, uh, Dr. Anil, Edwin, and Poonam. And I wanted to hand back to Racheta. Uh, excellent conversation. And I think uh, good points which needs to be taken up with various authorities, which will make really our exports to Gulf and Saudi Arabia will definitely boost. Uh, your... Thank you. Uh, thank you, Logistic Insider. Back to you, Racheta. Racheta, you're on mute. 
you are on mute right thank you thank you so much so uh, i i totally agree with you pramod sir that this was uh, indeed a very very um, exciting very interesting conversation and and to sum up uh, from from what i understood uh, being a complete layman um i think uh, navigating the regulatory landscape uh, when when coming to any country and for that matter in gulf as well um it it is very complex uh, but it is equally essential and um it impacts every aspect of business uh in in the ksa and the gulf region now we've learned about the importance of um uh local laws understanding local laws and regulations building local uh relationships and investing in technology and logistic solutions to ensure uh there's there's compliance and to avoid the penalties now as we close this panel i'd like to um emphasize that critical role that collaboration and communication play in achieving um this regulatory compliance that we are talking about especially in the gulf region because um from what i understood they take their uh, uh, you know they take the regulations and their norms pretty seriously um the the insights and experiences uh, shared by our panelists today underscore the need for ongoing dialogue and engagement between the government the industry and the uh, and all the other stakeholders and it is only through such collaboration that we can continue to foster a business environment that supports innovation growth and prosperity for both the countries so with this i'd like to uh, end today's session i thank you once again uh, all our panelists uh, for joining us today taking out time and thank you so much to our audience as well we hope uh, you enjoyed the show and um, Yep I think that is it and uh, you guys have a really good day ahead goodbye thank you thank you thank you thank you bye 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 bye